This is Odo reminding you to catch the Odo Show and the other viewpoint at our new time, Sunday from 10 to midnight, for the very best in radio music and some of the most in depth topics around, right here on your community radio station, 88.1 WHPR. I'm Hoda. Who are you? You're listening to. You're listening to. You're listening to. You're listening to. The Hodo Show. On 88.1 FM. All right. Something's wrong here, but nobody believes it. Little of that kid Cuddy for you. Well, we're back. This is, of course, the Hodo Show and the other viewpoint. Live right here at TV 33 WHPI 88.1 FM. And you can pick us up on your cell phone or on your laptop or however you want to do it at www.tv33whpr.com. As promised, I have a guest on our live line. She goes by the name of June Cross. She is an author. She writes documentaries, producer, director, acclaimed director for a documentary that she did in the past. Her present documentary, documentary film is entitled Public Health, Private Pain. And we're going to let you see a short clip of that momentarily and kind of sort of introduce Miss Cross to you. And then also in studio we have singing group Unique. They'll be doing their first stint here on the Hodo Show and the Other Viewpoint as well as we have a couple of the cast members from the stage play when God shows up and we have ticket giveaways that we'll talk about later on right now we want to keep it on a serious note so with no further ado I want to show you a little clip from the film entitled public health private pain stay locked in this is of course the Hodo show and the other viewpoint <laughs> My name is Lisa Desai and the title of the film is called Public Health, Private Pain and I am a producer on the film. We've been filming it for two years in the rural part of South Carolina, which is one of the nine southern states in the United States that have the most new cases, uh, new rates of infection of HIV. And two thirds of those new cases are among African American women. The one thing that struck me most in South Carolina was that people who were out of sight were out of mind. You have people who are living in the end of dirt roads, people who are living in rural areas where they can't afford gas, they may not even have a car. Politicians didn't seem to care about um, their needs. And I really got the sense that if we saw the same numbers that we were seeing in Williston, South Carolina, in New York, or you know, in Connecticut, there would be a very different response. There is discrimination. There's discrimination among the attitudes um, that doctors have. There's discrimination within the black church. It seems like if we can't get people talking about it openly without condemnation, without fear, um, the epidemic will continue and infections will continue to, to rise. Black women who are 16 to 34, number one killer, AIDS. Not domestic homicide, not guns, not drugs, AIDS. Despite the fact that we don't see families like Wilhelmina's every day, they matter and their lives are important and they deserve the same kind of treatment and care that all of us have access to. So what we want this film to do is begin to educate that population themselves about what it is they need to do and what it is they need to be fighting for from the politicians in their state to get the kind of care that they need to keep themselves alive. All right, so that lets you know what the film is about. And so with no further ado, we want to introduce award-winning producer and writer, as well as author, Ms. June Cross, to the Detroit audience. How you doing, Ms. Cross? Okay, how are you, Hodo? Uh, not bad. Now, we're going to jump right into this thing, and what I basically want to know is how did you even come up or those of you who produced and, and came up with this whole thing, how did, how did this even cross your mind? Well, we were actually working on another show, and um, Lisa Desai, who 
in the clip that you showed, picked up a magazine and saw an article that was written by a 15-year-old girl who lived at the end of a dirt road named Deschal Dix. And Deschal had written <coughs> about what it was like to be born HIV positive and what it was like to live in a small town where nobody really understood what HIV was about um, and sort of some of the discrimination she went through and she couldn't find a boyfriend and people didn't want to be in the same room with her. She would take her meds and get sick. So she just found it interesting and intriguing and decided to drive out to this area where they shall live, which turned out to be an hour and a half from the nearest city. Uh, and they live in the, like a double wide trailer at the end of a dirt road. And um, she met Deschal and began talking to Deschal's grandmother, Wilhelmina. And we spent basically the last two or three years getting to know this family because, frankly, I didn't know that this was still going on in the United States. I thought mm-hmm. AIDS was something that we beat back back in the 80s, you know? Right. Um, and so to see that um, people are still having to face discrimination, that, um, you know, Deschel's mom, who was a, a drug addict, um, was still sort of dying slowly in ways that I hadn't seen since I was covering the story back in the 80s in New York City. And this, the numbers of people who were infected with HIV and nobody was doing anything about it, nobody wanted to talk about it, it was just... It just seemed like something that needed to be brought to public attention. Okay, okay. So when you entered into this thing, did you really get any shocks or or some things that you just never in in your wildest dreams would have come up with? Yes, I did. Um, One thing that we discovered was how many of the, you know, the thing, the the doctors and all the people that talk to you about AIDS are always saying, wear a condom, wear a condom, wear a condom. Well, it turned out that for many of these women, for a lot of women that were living with HIV, they had been sexually abused as children or raped as young women, you know, like between the ages of 18 and 22. You know, they had had sexual violence had been done to them. And the idea of being able to be in an intimate relationship with a man and demand that he do anything just was not even in their worldview. It just wasn't even something they could even think about. And I think that was a huge aha for me because I had sort of been one of those that just think, well, you just sort of decide you either do this or this ain't happening. And for me to meet so many women who said that they had been victims of sexual abuse as children and as young women was really, and the, and the linkage between that and the inability to really stand up for your right to even as a, as a human being say, I deserve better than this, that was a huge shock for me. And um, I actually just wrote a, a piece for the Huffington Post on this. Okay. It appeared this week. But I mean, it was just, it was, um, I, it was like when I first discovered it, what happened was I met this young woman who was actually a cousin of the 15-year-old that I had spoken about earlier. And she basically said it was so hard because she was on Medicaid, she couldn't get doctors to work with her on getting her drug regimen set together. She just basically went off her medications altogether and just waited for the end to come. She was committing slow suicide. Mm. Um and, you know, she was one, she had been, she was the product of, of a rape. Her mother had been raped and she had been, she was the result of it. And when she found out who she was or what she was, it just sort of destroyed her so much that she just didn't care about her life anymore. Mm-hmm. And her mama didn't really care about her life anymore because what can you really, I mean, you know, some women are capable of loving a love child more. Well, it's not even, that's not even a love child. A child is born of a rape, but others really couldn't. And it was just, the, the the emotional pain that so many of these women are living in just really shocked me. Okay. Um, it just did, yeah. Okay, now we have a couple more clips we want to show. And it's just interesting to me that it seems as though this is the something that has just been pushed to the side and nobody yeah. seems to think about it anymore, but... Looking at the rural areas where you were, it seems like even more so than in the cities. Yeah, actually, the, the greatest number of new cases of HIV in the United States are popping up in the American South, and 80% of those new cases are among black women. And we're not talking about this. And the money's not going down there, all the federal money's not going there because they put their money in the big cities, which where the, the biggest, the absolute biggest numbers of cases are. 
for all the new cases that are happening down in the South. So, you know, you got folks who are, like, you know, been raised that you don't talk about sex. This is just something that, you know, the church don't want you to talk about sex. It's not something to be discussed in polite company. Um, you know, you're living in a small town. Everybody knows your business anyway. You know, people are living and dying in shame and feeling stigmatized, and their parents are lying and saying that they died of cancer or they had, you know. It's, it's, really, it's really a sad thing. It's okay. just a sad thing, and it shouldn't be allowed to stand in, in this day and age. And this is 2012. Okay. Well, let's go to this next clip and uh, let the people see some of what I saw in the clips that you guys had posted. Okay. Uh, 